the most wonderful time of the year, Christmas. And what better way to get into the holiday spirit than with a minky couture blanket? Whether you're gathered around the tree with loved ones, roasting marshmallows by the fire, or just looking for a cozy way to stay warm on a chilly night, minky blankets are the perfect addition to your Christmas festivities. With a wide range of festive designs and colors, you can find the perfect blanket to match your holiday decor or gift to your loved ones. So this Christmas, make your holiday even cozier with a minky couture blanket. Head to minkycouture.com com now and find your perfect blanket just in time for the holiday happy holidays from Mickey couture linkedin presents welcome to the human capital innovations podcast where your source for personal professional and organizational growth and development where we share original research explore industry trends and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe we hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Amanda Ono about why you should embrace conflict over comfort. Amanda Ono, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it is wonderful to be with you. You're joining us from Toronto. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about why you should embrace conflict over comfort. Now, as human beings and social animals, uh, you know, we tend to shy away from conflict. Uh, Some people don't, but a lot of people do. And while, you know, being peacekeepers and, and trying to have good, healthy relationships with people, you know, is, is a good goal. I think sometimes we think conflict is contrary to that goal. And in fact, uh, addressing conflict in a productive way is actually a really important feature. And and when we talk about uh, workplace relationships and teams, you need to have a healthy, productive conflict if you're going to learn and grow and move things forward and have cool stuff and innovate. Uh, the question is, how do you do that, especially if people's general inclination is to try to avoid conflict and just kind of stay in the comfort zone? So we're going to unpack that and explore that together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Amanda's bio with everybody. Amanda Ono has spent her career learning to maximize a company's most valuable investment, its people. Boasting over 20 years of international experience in organizational development, HR consulting, and change management, she's implemented successful talent and leadership initiatives in six countries across four continents. You can currently find her at Resolver, a Kroll business and worldwide leader in defining risk intelligence, making her mark as both VP customer experience and VP of people and culture. Uh, Amanda, anything else you would like to share or highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, just to give a little context on what customer experience is, you know, so I I grew up, as you said, much of my career on the um, people and culture or human resource side, but, you know, I did have a great opportunity um, stepping into customer experience to act as an operator, you know, really looking at what are all the programs that we, we build and construct from a people and culture side and how does it translate when you're accountable to, you know, in your revenue, when you're accountable for scaling teams, global teams. So um, I think it's an important perspective. I've definitely added 
to my toolkit. Um, I've uh, actually recently um, transitioned also into a role of Chief Human Resource Officer at Kroll Digital mm-hmm. Services, so which is part of um, um, uh, coming up through Resolver. So that's a really exciting opportunity that I've had. So, you know, excited to, to be here to have a really fulsome conversation for folks on the people and culture side of things, but also on the operational side of things, because I've sat in both seats, I felt the, the heat in both areas, and uh, mm-hmm. certainly mm-hmm. Um, it has enriched my perspective. Yeah, wonderful. Well, why don't we dive on in and maybe we could start from a place of like, what do we get wrong about conflict and comfort? You know, our kind of natural inclination is to think, to think comfort good, conflict bad. Um, <laughs> but, For sure, you know, that's, it, that's good. That's a nice, that's a t-shirt, right? That's good. <laughs> but but that that's obviously overly simplistic. And in fact, in many ways, we're quite wrong. Um, so like, what are we getting wrong about how we think about comfort versus conflict? Uh, and then we can start to dive on into how we can go about things productively. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I think we've all had the experience in our personal lives where, you know, we've wanted to say something to family or friends and we just didn't because we didn't want to hurt their feelings. And then when the bad thing that we knew was going to happen happened, um, we say something like, oh, yeah, I saw that coming. And, And what's the response? Why didn't you tell me? And so I think we've all had that experience. And and I think that really translates over into the workplace because, you know, at the end of the day, it's not that conflict or different opinions are bad. It's what we do with it. It's if we are name calling, if we're focusing on the person, not the behavior, you know, it's, you know, we don't want to have kind of people that are in the office that are, you know, the the, the classic uh, archetype of the office jerk. But at the end of the day, you know, we want to have people that do share opinions um, and do share perspectives. T- to do that, you need to reframe what conflict actually means and and why it's important. Um, as an old mentor used to say to me, there's your truth, my truth, and the truth. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think having that that you know really comprehensive view on how you look at opinions is what gets you to the result faster you know just as you said you know how do you learn how do you grow as an organization you're only going to get there when you're maybe shaking the apple cart a little bit Mm -hmm. yeah yeah disrupting the status quo a little bit is a healthy thing (laughs) frankly most teams most organizations need it on a regular basis uh and when you don't have it you you end up stagnating um and you know, it can be comfortable for a time, but it's not so comfortable if you stagnate and then become irrelevant in the market. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, sales are down and you're and you're losing customers. And now you have to lay off members of your team. That's not comfortable. Like nobody wants yeah, that. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's, it's about always thinking, you know, how these things interact with each other. Um, and I happen to live in a place where I, I know that there's this exists everywhere, but it seems like here in Utah, there are so many just nice, friendly people, but there's a lot of passive aggression. Uh, and, right. and I think passive aggression comes from a place of people valuing comfort over conflict because they don't mm-hmm. want to be straightforward or blunt with you. They don't want to, you know, they're worried about any sort of perceived conflict or anger or, you know, negative interaction. And so it's, it's, you know, very nice people smiling at each other and then in subtle ways undermining or, or, you know, those passive aggressive behaviors, which actually can be very toxic. Uh, and so sure. I, I think people are well-intentioned. I don't think people are nefarious, but, you know, I think if, if I had a choice between, you know, kind of an office jerk, who's kind of blatantly in your face or someone who's passive aggressively kind of behind your back, undermining you, I'd actually personally take the 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 person who's straight to my face because right, uh, at least because i know least what you i'm know dealing where you with stand. yeah, yeah that's exactly right. now obviously i don't want either of those things but you know that you know that's mm-hmm. my personality and how i would approach it um but i i have found that sometimes i rub people the wrong way because you know if i see something i'm going to point it out and i'm you know I, i'm not going to attack the person but i am going to challenge some assumptions i'm going to challenge you know, why are we we making a decision this way or what's the process or how can things be improved? Like those are the types of things I'm always doing. And sometimes it's well-received, but a lot of times it's not. And it comes back to um, this, this idea of conflict versus comfort. And some people prioritize, you know, the comfort and really um, because of their own discomfort, they, they, they really are nervous or, or uncomfortable around the conflict. What they see is conflict from my perspective, I just see it as it's a healthy dialogue. Like we're having a debate. We're, we're pushing each other. We're pushing our thinking. We're trying to be creative, come up with creative solutions, but not everyone sees it that way.
For sure. And I think, you know, as it maps into an organization, it's thinking about how do you talk about these things? I mean, as we were Resolver, um, where we were building as a product led company, and it was important for us that courage was a value. And values aren't things that you put on the wall. Um, you know, it's things that you adopt in behaviors that are visible to people. And so that was that was an important first step for us. Um, but then we had to kind of operationalize it. And so we did it in a couple of ways. I mean, we, we started it in onboarding. Um, we kind of said to folks, you know, this is the environment. This is what courage means. This is why courage is good for us and conflict is good for us. It's, it's the why behind it. And what's interesting when you go through those conversations with folks that are joining an organization is, you know, everyone comes in with a backpack of their previous employer. And there's certainly people that were skeptical that were thinking, uh, you just want me to speak up because there's going to be a consequence. And that really wasn't the spirit. And so it was important, you know, as, as we look at a demonstrated value, again, onboarding, how do we talk about it at the very beginning of our conversation um, in the employee life cycle? And, you know, Kim Scott has done some fantastic work. Yeah. She has a book called Radical candor. I love that. Um, I think, you know, we we joke that our favorite API as a technology company is assume positive intent. And so I think as you're engaging in conversations early on in the journey of an employee, it's helping them understand that, you know, if, if John is coming to you with ideas and he's maybe being blunt, it's because he wants the best thing for the organization or the team. And so how do you enable people to be to be good at that? Well, it's not just like having the value, as I said, on the wall. We put it into our onboarding. Um, we, we put it into employee enablement. We, we actually trained people on how to give feedback. Um, you, you know, it's something if you think of um, uh, curriculum that you learn in school, it's it's not something we develop in, in, in um, students. And so people, we have these people that graduate that come into our work environments, but they actually don't really know how to constructively give feedback. So let's help them with that. Because if you want an environment where you're going to have, you're going to get rid of that comfort zone, you're really going to lean into the conflict that is going to come from different opinions, like help people with that. Um, Likewise, we had to mirror that with managers, right? We had to let managers know what does that mean? Um, Also to be a receiver of this kind of feedback, because it's, you know, you could spend all the time in the world building these programs for employees, but if managers receive constructive feedback or, or something that could be deemed as conflict and they don't receive it well, well, then that everything goes off the rails, right? So it was also really important for us to build that in manager enablement. So managers really understood how to look at different perspectives. And we actually, you know, even armed them with specific language, right? Because sometimes it's like in the moment, ego's there, right? Like whenever you're saying something that's a conflicting view, you can't tell me that there's not an element of ego, especially with managers that have been uh, groomed through their career to maybe be an authority and to know what they should be saying. And sometimes they don't, they, they can't be know everything. So, you know, actually giving managers language to say things like, huh, I hadn't thought about it that way. Or, yeah, that's a really different perspective. It, it allowed them to put into their toolkit as as people leaders some language that paused them. So rather than being, you know, the first response often when we are met with um, information that is uh, a dissenting opinion is to feel defensive, it, it allowed them to kind of step back and say, hey, maybe that person's right because they're in the weeds and I'm not. Um, so that was a really important part, you know, that building that enablement structure around our our team was so critical because you can't say we believe in, you know, disrupting uh, the status quo. We want you to, ha- to have courage and then just let people go forward. Because again, it's not really trained. It's not something that um, I, I think, again, you know, maybe in Salt Lake City, you know, Canadians are also known for being too nice. I think in many cultures, um, we, we, we lean on that. And I... Um, I always think of the the Brene Brown quote, which is um, clear is kind. And so, you know, as clear yeah. as you can be with people is the most kind thing you can do to them, um, for them, I should say, because that's ultimately what's going to help them um, in the long run. So that enablement framework was really critical for us. It went beyond the value that we stuck up on the wall in our website and, mm-hmm. and we did mm-hmm. some enablement. Um we also really focused on how do you create, you know, systems that sit underneath um, to, yeah. to have more fruitful conversations. And one thing we did and actually, you know, going into distributed work model with COVID really helped with this is, you know, 
being really good about meetings. This is probably a whole other topic. I'm sure there's lots of people that could talk for a long time about, you know, a really good meeting. But, you know, we found that when we structured the meeting with an agenda and with pre-reading that people were accountable for doing before they came to the meeting, the meetings became a lot more effective in terms of sharing those diverse opinions. And it allowed the different opinions or the conflict to arise, to not be in the heat of the moment and a thing Mm -hmm. where people felt they needed to respond, but something where it's like, I read that. And as I read it, I'm curious about these four things. Because we all know sometimes just having that extra 30 seconds to frame the feedback is actually the thing that's the most important. Because as you said, being blunt and the spirit of what you want to say is the same. Sometimes having that space and that preparation time for for people to prepare how they're going to talk about the the feedback or the different opinion just allowed for, for, you know, disruptive ideas to emerge much more effectively. So that was another thing. Again, not just enabling the managers and leaders, but setting up a meeting. So that can be true. Yeah. The systems and structures are really important and how you manage and, and facilitate meetings can be an important part of that. And you're absolutely right. I mean, some people are just really good at just off the top of their head on the fly, giving thoughtful commentary, you know, and and giving good insights on things. Um, Most people will benefit from having time to think things through first, even those people who are more comfortable just doing it on the fly. But there are a lot of people, a huge portion, like the the, the biggest portion of the workforce and the general population are people that need time to process. They need time to consider. Uh, and and especially if someone's a little bit more introverted, um, if, if you want to hear from them, you need to give them some time. Uh, they have good insights. They have good experiences. Uh, they're going to contribute to the conversation and get you further along in a better place if you listen to them. But if if you only have the loudest voices in the room, sucking up all the oxygen in real time, making all the comments, you're going to lose out on, you know, at least half, probably much more than half of the people uh, who could contribute in meaningful ways. Uh, And so what you just suggested is just a really simple thing, uh, but it's, it's a powerful approach to drastically, dramatically increasing um, the amount of uh, uh, contributions that you're getting from every member of your team. And people want to contribute. They want to feel valued, um, but they also want to feel safe. And sometimes in the heat of the moment, they don't feel safe. For sure. And, and you know, to build on the the thread, when you look at different personality types, we also found it was really helpful from an inclusion perspective, because people from underrecognized groups, right. they feel less yeah. comfortable speaking up. Um, also, people at different levels in an organization, you know, um, certainly you get an early contributor on the line with someone that's quite senior, while all of a sudden you follow the leader. But maybe they actually really have the idea that is going to be the game changer. So, you know, that that structure and that system becomes really important to 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 create an environment where people as you said feel safe to provide a different opinion feel safe to you know um say something that's a the contrary or conflicting view because the power has been removed from the situation right and and we found that was such a great benefit from a distributed workforce during covid and and one mm-hmm. we've certainly um continued the final thing that we really built was just how do you role model it i mean you know, it's true with the manager at the manager level, but, you know, your executive and senior leadership, do they talk about um, mistakes? And they do they talk about the fact that they made a misstep and then they learned from it and mm-hmm. they got a different opinion and they changed their mind um, or they evolved their opinion? You know, I, I think that was such a key thing for us too to really ingrain you know, the power of conflict into our organization. Um, Because again, you know, it is the the archetype is for a um, leader, a leadership tier or a CEO to be infallible, but we know that's not true. Um, And in fact, those that uh, show some humility are going to be the ones that are are able to grow the organization. So um, much like we do training at the manager level, are we seeing it role modeled kind of throughout the org up and down and across? Um, And when you do that, people realize, you know, 
having an opinion that is maybe not shared by everyone is okay. Um, and listen, you know, we, we do this when we do town halls. Um, mm-hmm. We do kind of an open mic where people can just ask, uh, ask me anything. We do kind of that AMA model, but, uh, you know, and it's not that the CEO can act on everything, um, but certainly to take in those perspectives and process them and understand that those different opinions are going to be what challenges us to move forward um, is such a powerful tool from a role modeling perspective, because just to go back to your point about safety, people then know that it, it just happens throughout the org and it's an important part of the culture. So you've given a lot of uh, good ideas and, and, uh, actionable tips, I think, that organizational leaders can utilize, I think, to start to make a shift, uh, a culture shift, a system shift, uh, to to make a difference for their teams and for their organizations. What happens, you know, say I'm a middle manager. Um, I, I buy into this, you know, I'm, we're having this conversation. It makes sense. It resonates with me. I buy into it. Um, I want to do this with my team, but I'm kind of stuck in the middle. And it's not the predominant organizational culture. So then we're getting conflicting kind of messages as a member of the team. You know, my boss is saying one thing, but their boss is saying something else. How how would you suggest we navigate that um, if you don't have top-down kind of support for this? I am a big believer in, you know, sphere of influence and every leader, regardless of formal role or not, uh, regardless of span of control and the size of their team, Every leader can have a direct influence on their team uh, and and make it a really positive place and increase the psychological safety and have a positive culture and those sorts of things and even insulate their team from some of the negative things or toxic things that might be happening elsewhere in the organization. That can happen. I, I believe leaders should try to do that, but it certainly is challenging um, when you're in an organization where the predominant culture and style of, of leadership up the line is different than what you're trying to do. Any thoughts or suggestions around how to navigate that? Yeah, it's it's a great call out. I think there's a couple things that I would look at because certainly I've worked in orgs where, where that was true. Um, I, I think, you know, from a change management perspective, the, the, the adage is um, change is rooted in results. And mm-hmm. so, you know, how can a manager, perhaps a middle manager, take a small win that they had with a, with a different opinion or something that felt like conflict in the moment? And how can they celebrate to upper management and maybe skip levels above that, you know, receiving that feedback actually, you know, created a positive output for the organization. So, you know, how do we, how do we start to celebrate and communicate those things? I think when you're um, going through the process of starting to shift any culture, um, probably the vast majority of the work you do is communication. It's talking Mm -hmm. about the things that worked, talking about the things that didn't, um, um, and I think being okay to, um, you know, kind of proactively celebrate those things. I think, you know, many in many cultures and environments, you don't want to um, kind of toot your own horn. But sometimes, you know, when you're when you're trying to go through the shift, it's it's figuring out how you can do that artfully um, and kind of share, hey, this happened and this was the result. And, you know, we'd love to see more of this. Um, I think is a, is a key way it can be shifting, uh, start to shift. Um, but you're spot on, uh, you know, there, there has to be an organizational readiness, um, to be willing to take different perspectives and different feedbacks and embrace the fact that more results are going to come from conflict than comfort. Um, and so uh, again, it's celebrate the small wins and, and, uh, yeah. rinse and repeat and talk about it as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. And it not only taking the small wins, not only is that important to, to, you know, have the bottom up kind of impact that you're trying to have and, and demonstrate through results, um, to those up the line, it's, it's going to help communicate things and, and perhaps develop some readiness and some buy-in and some commitment around it, but your team needs it. You need it. Like if you're going to, cont- you're going to burn out if you don't have that. So <laughs> you have to For take sure. the. Take the small wins, celebrate with your team, enjoy the the healthy environment that you're creating with your team. Um, absolutely, that's that's critical. Uh, and then uh, hopefully over time, you can also 
model and demonstrate for other areas and, and uh, other leaders up the line, you know, that there's perhaps a different way, a, a way that will be even more beneficial for the organization. Yeah. And I think to, to build on that point, you know, it, it also having many voices on your team come from different perspectives as a manager kind of takes the pressure off, right? Because you realize that you're having different data points that maybe interact with different customers, different stakeholders, that's going to get you to a more fulsome opinion than just you making the call, right? So it's also in the, certainly in the manager's best interest, not only from an engagement perspective in the team, but also for you personally, right? It's like, there are, you know, fantastic people probably within your organization that, as you said before, are just really wanting to share an opinion wanting to share an idea and and maybe that's the game changer that the organization needs it's just you know the question comes back to us from a leadership perspective which is how do you influence that that change um and enable folks and build the systems to have the values that last for a long time um for us to move away um from that that comfort zone yeah well said. Amanda, this has just been a great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go here in a few minutes, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I invite people to certainly follow me on LinkedIn. You know, I, I post things, um, getting back into a regular cadence um, on on topics like this. Um, and certainly check out the work that we're, you know, for anyone that's interested, the work we're doing at Curl, Curl Digital Services is a, a new business line. We're doing really innovative stuff in the technology space uh, to, f- to provide, you know, financial and risk intelligence across industries. So I know insight and making sure people were managing and mitigating risk became something that was um, probably top of mind for most folks in organizations through COVID and beyond. But, you know, if anyone's interested in thinking about how they might future-proof their org through technology and intelligence, you know, would love to to have that conversation as well. Um, Final word (laughs) from that perspective. I mean, it's it's a big one, but I would say that, um, you know, my experience with this is that change can start with an individual. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It might not be an org wide thing to start, um, but certainly you embracing the fact that you assume positive intent when you deliver feedback. Um, you're there to provide different perspectives that may feel like conflict, um, but ultimately is towards a bigger goal is the thing that's going to make your organization successful in the long run. So it can be uh, many steps to get there, um, but it certainly for our, each 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 person um, listening in, you know, it can start with you. Um, and that would be the first place I go. Yeah. Wonderful. Amanda, again, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Amanda and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. If you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.